If you've ever wanted to be led around on horseback by a naked guy or share cake with a drag queen, then it's time to get in a time machine and check out the unbridled club scene of the 1970s. Studio 54 in Manhattan established the template to the modern club, the illusion of exclusivity, the glamour of celebrity, and an extremely permissive policy toward pretty much everything. It was so successful that co-founder Steve Rubell once bragged that he made more money than the Mafia, and when it was raided in 1978, the cops reportedly found garbage bags of cash in the basement. Part of the club's success had to do with its ability to lure celebrities there, sometimes with lavish parties thrown in their honor. And that's exactly how they got country superstar Dolly Parton to show up in 1978. As recounted in the book The Last Party, Studio 54 co-founder Ian Schrager came up with the idea to actually build a farm on the dance floor, complete with live animals. And it worked, as Parton actually did show up, but she was freaked out by the size of the crowd and the weirdness of the setup. So she reportedly sat by herself in one of the balconies and left early, which honestly sounds like the right reaction to walking into a club in the middle of Manhattan and finding a farm waiting for you. Another iconic 70s New York club was CBGB. The name was short for Country Bluegrass and Blues, which turned out to be wildly inaccurate, as it was instead the epicenter of punk rock and new wave in that decade. CBGB is also known as the birthplace of the legendary punk band The Ramones. When they took the stage on August 16, 1974, CBGB had only existed for a short time. It was just another dive bar in a sketchy neighborhood. It had a reputation for letting raw, untested musicians book gigs, and it also had a rule against cover songs. While that prohibition was devised to avoid paying fees to copyright holders, it also meant that a lot of experimental and interesting music graced the stage. But nobody was expecting history to be made that night. The Ramones reportedly hit the stage and blasted through their entire set in just 12 minutes. Most of their songs were less than two minutes long. The band ultimately played at the club at least 70 more times in 1974 on their way to becoming punk legends. Basically, if you want to come and have a good time and be entertained. If the names Jane County and Handsome Dick Manitoba aren't familiar to you, get ready to be schooled. Manitoba is infamous as the former lead singer of the classic punk band The Dictators, while County was the lead singer of Wayne County and The Electric Chairs. She later became punk rock's first openly transgender performer. Back in the 1970s, she was still performing as Wayne County when she took the stage at CBGB with Manitoba in the audience, and things didn't exactly go well. As recounted by Rolling Stone, Manitoba heckled County throughout the show, and she gave as good as she got. When Manitoba climbed on stage, she clobbered him with her mic stand, breaking his collarbone and nearly killing him. He threatened to sue. The underground music scene in New York at the time was dealing with a growing homophobia problem, and the incident brought that out into the open. LGBTQ performers like County began to look for safer places to perform, creating a schism in the club scene. Fortunately, though, County and Manitoba eventually buried the hatchet and have since become good friends and even recorded music together. Max's Kansas City was arguably just as important as CBGB, if a little less gross. As recounted by Far Out Magazine, Iggy Pop and the Stooges played there in 1973. The club had a very small stage with tables right up against it. The Stooges were a big draw at the time, so the place was packed, and Iggy Pop had grown frustrated with the tiny stage. So one night, he decided to start walking on the tables as if they were an extension of the stage. It was going great until one of the tables tipped over, sending him crashing down onto another table covered in glasses. Iggy ended up with a puncture wound in his chest and discovered that if he pulled his arm a certain way, blood would spurt out. So he started doing it on purpose, spraying his audience with his own blood, which was probably a health code violation. He kept singing through the whole ordeal. The crew tried unsuccessfully to bandage him up with some gaffer tape, and his blood-soaked performance became a stuff of legend. Oh, I get it. They're gory. Studio 54 is legendary today as a representation of the endless party that supposedly defined the 1970s, but it almost failed completely. After a splashy and well-attended launch, attendance fell off immediately, and the club struggled to get enough people inside to make a profit. It was a huge space and needed about a thousand people inside every single night if it was going to make a dime. The owners did everything they could think of, but for the first five weeks or so, they barely got by. Then fashion designer Halston booked the club to throw a birthday party for Bianca Jagger, then wife of Rolling Stone's frontman Mick. As recounted by Vanity Fair, this included having a naked man covered in gold glitter leading Jagger around on the back of a white horse. Photos of the event were instantly everywhere, and suddenly Studio 54 was the place to be, with crowds thronging outside. To this day, Jagger has to explain to people that she didn't ride through the streets of Manhattan on the horse. Instead, she and Mick just walked in like regular people. Regular wealthy and famous people, but still. 
It's hard to understand today just how unique Studio 54 was when it opened. It was an everything goes nightclub where they literally had a giant mechanical moon lifting a spoon filled with cocaine to its nose as part of the decoration. Studio 54's official launch happened on April 26, 1977, and it was a glitzy affair. Celebrities from all walks of life were invited, including Donald Trump, who arrived with his first wife, Ivana. Other icons of the 1970s soon stopped by as well, like Cher, Warren Beatty, Frank Sinatra, Margot Hemingway, and many others. As recounted by the Daily Beast, the real party soon erupted outside the club. A doctor had seen fit to bring a bottle of medical-grade quaaludes to the opening, and he began handing them out to everyone on the street. Soon enough, the celebs dancing inside probably wished they were outside, as a full-on orgy had broken out, with people disrobing in the street and dancing wildly. Sadly, many of the people in that crowd probably don't remember very much about that unforgettable evening. The Mercer Arts Center is largely forgotten today, but for a few years in the early 70s, it was one of the most important music venues in New York City. It's most closely associated with the influential proto-punk band The New York Dolls. As recounted by Vulture, on the evening of August 3, 1973, the center was preparing to welcome about 2,000 eager audience members, and the building began showing signs of imminent collapse. Bricks were literally falling, and wooden beams were groaning under sudden stress. Around 5 p.m., just before people were due to arrive, the building collapsed into a heap of rubble, killing the poor. A fictionalized version of the moment kicked off HBO's short-lived series Vinyl, and implied that it was the sheer rock and roll power of the New York Dolls that brought the walls down. The collapse shouldn't have been a surprise, as the building had been showing signs of problems for years. Today, you can still see the original roof line of the center on the brick of the building next door. If you want to trace the evolution of the 70s club scene in New York, you have to go back to the very beginning of the decade. As recounted by NPR, on February 14, 1970, a young man named David Mancuso realized that he needed money for the rent on his loft apartment at 647 Broadway. To cover the bills, the record collector and audiophile decided to try an age-old technique, a rent party. He assembled a diverse cross-section of Manhattan natives, provided music and a dance floor, and charged a modest entry fee. He also delved into his huge stack of albums and served as the DJ, insisting that all records be played in their entirety. The LGBTQ community at the time had few safe places to dance and enjoy themselves, so the loft, as it became known, was immediately popular. Mancuso's parties were underground, but perfectly legal, and established the hunger for a nightlife marked by a casual attitude, an inclusive vibe, and plenty of great music. These parties incubated the club culture that erupted into vibrant life later in the decade when splashier, more formal clubs opened up. It's fun to imagine what it must be like when a bunch of famous creative people have a few drinks and hang out together, except sometimes it's not always as exciting as it sounds. Iggy Pop was introduced to David Bowie at Max's Kansas City in 1971, and Lou Reed was also there. But the meeting of these musical icons wasn't the sort of amazing celebrity hangout you might imagine. Instead, it was a rather awkward evening. As Bowie recalled, It was me, Iggy, and Lou Reed at one table with absolutely nothing to say to each other, just looking at each other's eye makeup. It's kind of comforting to know that famous people can find themselves at a loss for small talk just like the rest of us. Things eventually got less awkward as Bowie became good friends with Iggy and Reed and worked with both of them many times. There were elements of what Lou was doing that I thought were just uh, unavoidably right for both the times and for where music was going. Xenon doesn't get as much attention as Studio 54, partly because it was designed to be a near-carbon copy, but just because it wasn't terribly original doesn't mean crazy stuff didn't happen there. Take the time in 1978 when Grace Jones threw herself a 30th birthday party. She reportedly rode in on a motorcycle and posed with the bike on the dance floor. She was soon surrounded by half-naked dancers who crowded around her, along with the drag queen Divine. When the birthday cake arrived, everyone grabbed a piece and fed each other, including Jones and Divine. The most remarkable thing about the whole moment is that it was captured on film, and it's clear that everyone was having a grand time. For Jones, there was also always an element of performance, as she's quoted as saying, It required a lot of hard work and good makeup to be accepted as a freak. Nothing underscored the anything-can-happen vibe in the 1970s quite like Sally Lipman. She was 77 years old when Studio 54 opened. She was a lawyer by trade but hadn't practiced in decades, and she achieved a bit of celebrity and a whole lot of joy when a young friend brought her to the club. As she danced wildly with people decades younger than her, she became a sensation and earned herself the nickname Disco Sally. In short, Lipman was a beloved regular who often invited the staff back to her apartment for dinner. She truly loved the freedom that the 70s club scene offered. As former Studio 54 manager Scott Bitterman once said, 
Sally represented the best of the club for me. She was neither rich nor famous. She was a woman who loved to dance and have fun with her friends in the evening.